Exclusive Deadpool and Brave New World footage drops at CinemaCon, plus Thunderbolt's title update and Paramount's plethora of projects. All of that and more on this week's Multiverse News. Welcome to Multiverse News, your source for information about all your favorite fictional universes. My name is Matthew Carroll, and with me on the panel today, I have Haley Hobbs. How's it going, Haley? Oh, I didn't know I was going to be first. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. You never know. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, Jay Sisson. How's it going, Jay? Hey, I'm doing well. I have a suggestion, though, for a change in title to our show. You know, we're called Multiverse oh. News, but how about this? Mm. Multiverse News, but then an asterisk. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's intriguing. I will say that. It is intriguing. What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> and Jay Scotty St. Clair, what's going on, bud? Oh, I'm doing all right. I'm surprised the thought has never occurred to me before, but if I don't have like a quippy response locked and loaded, it kind of feels like the Spider-Man No Way Home scene when you're the last introduced. It's like, Peter 3. Peter <laughs> no, you're Peter one forever in our oh, hearts. Oh, thank you. Because, <laughs> you know, I was Peter one and I did a terrible job. So, you're no, Peter you're, one. No, <laughs> no, I'll be Peter three. <laughs> Peter three has the most heart. So, it doesn't really matter which Peter you are. It's, it's always good to be a Peter. <laughs> little, little, inside, uh, little inside baseball as to why everyone gets the order they get. It's just because of whoever joins the the Zencaster feed like basically what we're using for zoom and then how they end up laid out on my screen i just always go in order of who, where everyone is <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it there's no, no other magic to it um, <laughs> and that's how the sausage is made yeah, that's right um okay so uh first off we have our five-star review for this week thank you thank you uh september 2016 is apparently a, a username and not just a like time period. There um, were a lot of additional numbers after t September 2016. <laughs> I decided to just cut it off there. <laughs> oh man, I would have done it. I would have just gone two zero one six five four three two. Um, the they say uh, truly love the show and what you all bring. Have been listening since day one. Ooh, a day one multiverse day news one listener, an OG, OG. Is what we call them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, dig it. I dig it. Thank you, September. Appreciate you. Um, and uh, you guys ready to dive into the show? Dive into the news? Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, we we stay ready. Are you prepared? <laughs> <laughs> Marvel Studios had a strong showing during last week's CinemaCon in Las Vegas, where Kevin Feige dropped bombs and F-bombs while unveiling footage from Deadpool and Wolverine and Captain America Brave New World. The look at Deadpool featured nine minutes of spoiler-free material introduced by director Sean Levy, which was preceded by a comedic clip with the title characters in costume bemoaning cell phone use in the theater. Meanwhile, the Cap 4 scene included an interaction between Anthony Mackie, Sam Wilson, and Harrison Ford as Thunderbolt Ross, with Isaiah Bradley factoring into a confrontation. Marvel's current lineup of films have been no stranger to delays, reshoots, and rewrites. Do these updates elicit explicitives of excitement from us? I'm not quite cursing or cussing yet, but I am pretty excited, and I, I do find myself being kind of jealous of those that were able to attend CinemaCon. Uh, we started this show about a year ago, and you know we, we talked about maybe making some uh, appearances as press, but I definitely think CinemaCon is one that we should gun for with all the exclusives that were revealed here. So I have not seen a minute of any of this footage. I'm only going based on uh, descriptions that were put out in official publications. So in terms of the Deadpool stuff, I have no idea. They say it's spoiler free, but I, I haven't read or heard anything and I don't really want to. Uh, but the fact that, you know, they did have an intro with uh, the title characters in costume, we, I don't think we talked about it on the show, but sometime last week we got the news that uh, the first appearance of uh, Wolverine in costume as he's going to appear in this movie was uh, on uh, like a promotional soda cup that came out uh, during CinemaCon as well. So the fact that people got to see Wolverine in the in the yellow and blue, like pretty jealous about that. Uh, but outside of that, I do think the the big thing here is the Cap 4 scene because there are a lot more like official 
descriptions of the footage out there. So um, mm-hmm. it sounds like it's really going to be picking up the torch and the mantle directly from Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see Harrison Ford as Thunderbolt Ross and the fact that we're bringing Carl Lumley back. And uh, I don't know exactly what kind of role he's going to play, but he obviously is a figure that looms large, especially in the, for the legacy of uh, Sam Wilson there. So the, you know, this, this phase has seen a lot of delays, reshoots, and rewrites, as we've talked about, but it really feels like Marvel has course-corrected, hit its stride, and I think CinemaCon was kind of like the El Capitan moment that we had back in 2014. Maybe not the same heights, but it definitely got me excited for the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, some things stand out here, like the... Uh uh, what what I've seen is that the Deadpool scene from the beginning, the cell phone thing was not just a cinema con thing. Like they're actually going to have that in the theater with the movie, which I think is kind of oh, cool. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> evidently it's kind of like he's walking through and he's saying something like that seems very spoilery, like uh, in secret wars, they're going to introduce. And then he cuts off and tells everybody to silence their cell phones or something, which is really funny. But, uh, but yeah, I guess that's going to actually be in the theater. Um, the cap four stuff is interesting to me because what we've heard about this movie so far is that within the delays, I mean, it was a massive delay. Like, if you guys remember, like, it got delayed by a year. I mean, it wasn't just months. Sure. Like, it was literally got pushed back a year. So, a lot of that was because it was testing extremely poorly. Like, they were showing it to test audiences and getting a lot of negative feedback about how the story was written and how it was shot and everything. And so, it seems like they've really gone back to the drawing board, which can make you nervous a little bit about a movie whenever they're cutting it up and they're doing weeks of reshoots and they're bringing everybody back in and trying to rework it in a different vision uh, and then pushing it out a year to try to do that. But with that being said, at least this footage uh, speaking, a lot of people came out of CinemaCon and they were impressed by this. Like they were saying like, that was some of the f- my favorite stuff that I watched this whole week, like was seeing that, like that was really exciting. It was very like, even Kevin Feige himself compared it to the Winter Soldier. You know, he talked about how like, that was really what they were gunning for. Like we understand what made the Winter Soldier so popular is that it was like a political thriller and it was like a, a boots on the ground type thing. And we really aim to do that uh, with with this film too. And so I thought that was an interesting connection. I do appreciate just on another note, seeing Kevin Feige kind of could be excited a little bit to introduce some stuff and talk about Marvel studios. Like it seems like, you know, this reset ultimately that we've talked on and off about for the last few months that Marvel's doing, I, I don't know. I, I have a lot of hope for it. I think it's a positive move in the right direction, like taking their time, working on these projects, like really working on testing them out, rewriting, reshooting if they need to, and really honing down on these key projects. So I'm excited. I mean, I think uh, I think this is this is all good news. Like, I mean, I think Deadpool is going to blow people out of the water, and uh, I get a little bit more intrigued by this Cap 4 movie every day we hear about it. Yeah, I, I mirror everything you guys have said. I, I like uh, everything I'm hearing from the CinemaCon stuff. I, I like. I, I don't know what else I can really say except for what you guys have said. I kind of took a, stole. How are you stealing my thunder, you two? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we were talking about that on uh, Pandavision this week. We were covering uh, Fallout, and uh, and then you guys kept saying all my stuff before I could say it. Um, but no, uh, it's really rad. And the thing that probably excites me the most is the connectivity. Uh, you mentioned it, Jay Scotty, but the connectivity of uh, this to Falcon Winter Soldier. Some of the things seem to be leading leading me to believe there's going to be connections between these two movies, particularly the Thunderbolt Ross of it all, and like introducing a character played by Harrison Ford should be a big mm-hmm. deal. And like the fact that Thunderbolt mm-hmm. is coming out shortly after, it just seems like they're connecting it hot, strong to uh, Falcon Winter Soldier. We're getting strong connectivity to like Loki from. Uh, from Deadpool and Wolverine, and mm. then we're going to have this Thunderbolts, which seems like it'll connect strongly to uh, Cat 4 as well. So it just seems like they're really going to have a year and a half of like strong, connective stuff, and I'm just pumped for that. Feige's quote that made me chuckle was, people seem to still talk about Captain America the Winter Soldier, and I was like, you mean people's arguably number one favorite movie of the franchise for a lot of the <laughs> fan base? Like, it was kind of funny that he <laughs> threw it out a little flippantly, but he knows how much people love that movie and how popular that style was within the whole Infinity Saga and then beyond, even into the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, so I'm definitely looking forward to that, kind of as a redemption to secret invasion as well which we thought was going to be the same kind of thing and just really Mm -hmm. was such a letdown in so many different ways like in the cinematography and stuff like that maybe not so much but what we thought we were going to get with that we're definitely going to get 
with Cap 4, and I'm super excited for that. I hope you're right. I really hope you're right. It does feel like getting that tone for Winter Soldier is difficult. And, like, they, I think they got pretty close to the tone with Secret Invasion, but then Secret Invasion went off the rails. Mm-hmm. So, like, I really hope that not just the tone, but you have to make a good movie with a character arc that makes sense. And, like, that's the thing is, like, it's not just the thriller, you know, uh, tone that we want. It's the, like, adult storytelling with good character development. Like, you gotta, you gotta do it all, you know? Well, and certainly no shade to William Hurt. He'll be missed in the role because he was a great mm. Thunderbolt Ross, but I am excited to see Harrison Ford in the MCU. I just love him to pieces, and he's um, he's such a good, like, serious action actor, but he's also got really great comedic chops, and so oh, yeah. he fits into this grounded spy thriller really well. I just really hope he tells someone to get off his plane. Uh, <laughs> I hope yeah. he puts his <laughs> finger in somebody's <laughs> face. <laughs> in the actual scene itself which i won't describe it because i think like spoilers you know and if you want to hear about the scene there's plenty of people out there who've described what the, happens in the scene but the scene yeah. does have very strong connections i, I read the description it has very strong connections to winter soldier like just in kind of what happens and like the narrative of what's mm. going on in the scene and stuff like that so uh to me like that that was intentional um and uh, it does seem to kind of like they maybe took the Winter Soldier as almost like a template in a way to try to develop this type of film. They kind of said like, hey, maybe this is what people want from Captain America. Like maybe they they want this guy who's solving a political crisis or whatever. Uh, and it's mm. it's more grounded and he's not in space or whatever. Like that's what people are looking for in these types of movies. Yeah. And that would be really fitting because the Winter Soldier was, was when Sam Wilson made his debut. So to kind of go back and pay homage to that film and the tone feels like appropriate to make that character kind of come full circle. His suit even kind of looks like Cap's suit in that. Oh yeah. It looks movie. good. Oh yeah. yeah. Good call. Huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Up next, Paramount also made several major announcements during its CinemaCon panel, uh, officially confirming the Transformers and GI Joe crossover film is in development and will be produced by Steven Spielberg. An R-rated live-action feature film adaptation of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin storyline, was also announced, as was a new Star Trek origin film that will act as a prequel to the 2009 movie, slated for a 2025 release. Perhaps most importantly, the studio debuted the trailer for Gladiator 2, uh, starring Paul Mescal, Pedro Pascal, and Denzel Washington. A clear case of franchise fever taking place at Paramount. What's our prognosis on the this plethora of projects? All right, I'm just going to say it, okay? And I'll take any heat that comes from it. But bring on Gladiator 2, all right? Bring on Gladiator 2. I'm excited for it. I really liked that original, I think it was 2009 is when that movie came out, maybe? Or maybe it was even earlier than that. Gladiator? The no, original? it was like 2000. 2000? 2000. 2000. 2000. 99 or 2000, I think yeah. I meant. I think in my head I meant to say 99. I said 2009. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like... I mean, I, I like that movie. Um, I know a lot of people hear that and they're like, why are we making a follow-up to a movie from 25 years ago or whatever? But like, um, hearing the description of this uh, scene that they showed, which was like in the Coliseum and like featured like all this like drama and violence and all this type of stuff, like it got me excited. And like a lot of people coming out of uh, CinemaCon, they said they said that they were like, man, I was watching all this stuff and I just was captivated by Gladiator 2. Like it looks big, it looks beautiful. It like the actors are locked in. Uh, you know, Denzel's doing his thing. Like Paul Mescal's playing this like emperor and if you remember back from the original film like joaquin phoenix played like a really good emperor like a villain type character and people are saying like he's he's really pulling from that it's that type of style um and then you know you got pedro in there i mean come on like what else could you could you ask for so uh yeah i'm, I'm excited for this like I, I'm, I'm gonna be uh really intrigued whenever a trailer finally hits for this because i think like that's gonna be a trailer it's gonna have a lot on its shoulders i mean a lot of people are probably not even aware that they're making a gladiator too but whenever that hits the internet you're going to have a lot of people who remember that russell crowe movie back in the day and they're going to go oh a gladiator 2 and th- th- that trailer is going to either convince them that it's needed or it's going to turn them off from the idea so i think like 
that's that's intriguing. I think the biggest eyebrow raise from this uh, is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, uh, the R rated, and the fact that it's live action was was kind of shocking to me. Like this is something that hasn't really been talked about, hasn't really been rumored even. The Last Ronin is, I guess, a series that ran uh, for a little bit about uh, a Ninja Turtle left over after the other three have died and like dealing with this like violent oh, wow. fallout and trying to kind of like adapt to dealing with that type of stuff. But it's incredibly violent, you know. And so the, the idea of adapting that to R-rated, I mean, we're seeing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles expansion of a universe. We're seeing the growth of this. We've got a video game in the works. We've had animated movies, like animated series, like all of that. So that was interesting to me. I don't really know if I'm like, you know, saying like, give me this movie right now, but it's more just like, I'm intrigued by that idea of like, that that was something that came out uh, here at CinemaCon. It just seemed like big news to me, but overall, yeah, some mm. exciting stuff in the work at Paramount. I mean, they were firing, firing stuff off uh, at CinemaCon. I'll get my complaint out of the way. I was disappointed and surprised that we didn't get anything about Mission Impossible 8. Mm-hmm. You know, given the fact that that was supposed to come out this summer and we're having to wait a whole another year, I thought we would get a little bit of something. We have had some casting here recently, but I'll hone in on the G.I. Joe Transformers crossover film because those are those are two properties that feel like they've been pretty tapped and pretty mined by Paramount uh, to not much great success, especially G.I. Joe. I, I think Transformers has had some good entries. I did see Rise of the Beast last summer, and they they did have the post credit tease about this crossover with GI Joe. So I'm more interested in Transformers when they're doing the smaller stories, like the Bumblebee. I think was the the best thing they've done in recent years. But so you you take two franchises that I'm not all that interested in that, that aren't working all that well, and combining the two of them suddenly it raises my interest. I won't <laughs> say a significant amount, but it at least makes me interested. Whereas I wouldn't be checking either of these movies or, or you know films from these franchises out unless there was really strong word of mouth with this crossover it, it reminds me of you know being a, a seven eight year old kid and having the toy box and doing the the mixing and matching so in that sense i'm really excited for it and i'll check it out but uh jay i think you covered the last ronin pretty well i will just say for my purposes i kind of hope given the fact that this is r-rated that they will keep the budget a little bit smaller make it dark and a smaller film and make it for the appropriate audience. I think there's even a potential for them to go back to like the prosthetic kind of robotic animatronic puppet suits. Mm -hmm. I think that's the audience that they're kind of looking for there. And then, yeah, beyond that, if they could just really, you know, embrace a dark tone and and bring the violence and just uh, to touch on gladiator Two a little bit, I did find myself kind of surprised. I I obviously knew that, you know, Pedro was going to be in there. I recall hearing that Paul Mescal was going to be in there, but I completely forgot Denzel was going to be in this thing. So as soon as I saw him, I thought about a story we talked about not that long ago, but I guess he's supposed to be in a Hannibal adaptation. So I don't know if this helps or hurts his cause there because it kind of feels like he's already <laughs> playing that role in this movie so. it's going going real deep into the Rome well uh, over the next couple <laughs> years here it's, just, <laughs> it's all he can think about apparently apparently <laughs> all men it's all we can think about uh you know uh I'm the thing that rose raised my eyebrows most in this this series of movies is this Star Trek origin I mean you may not be surprised it's me I like Star Trek but here's the thing who wants that like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you get, sure, the 2009 spinoff movie is a thing, but I don't feel like it has the fan base that wants an origin story. I think, like, the people that like those movies, and I'm one of them, but, like, especially the people who aren't into other Star Trek, they probably want to see the story go forward and see those actors come back. I don't see who wants... the. The 2009 Star Trek was an origin story. <laughs> like, I don't sure. know what they're doing. Like, it it literally starts with the creation of a new timeline and does this whole spinoff thing. And it's like, why would you give an origin to that? I don't know. It's very, it's very confusing to me. Like, there's a lot of Star Trek movies I want to see. If this comes out, I will see it. I'll be excited for it, probably. But, like, hearing the idea sounds terrible to me. It sounds like nothing that I really want from this universe. Is this different than we said they're maybe talking about doing a fourth of the Star Trek? This is different. different? Yeah, this is different. Yeah. They were clear about that. Like they were like, this is not the one you think it is. It's a a different movie. Those kind of qualifying statements give me lots of faith. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> it's like the exhibit, the exhibit, uh, pimp my ride meme where he's like, Hey dog, we heard you like origin <laughs> stories. So we put an origin story in your origin story. <laughs> That's good. That's, That's a good. throwback for the children who might be listening. <laughs> People are like, oh, pimp my what? What are you talking about, old man? <laughs> Is that a popcorn bucket? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think, like, if you're going to do some sort of origin thing, like, just do a do a new universe or, like, do the 2009 thing again. Do something different with it. Like, doing an origin to a movie that only has three films in the franchise... To me, this seems like there's been much discussion about what Paramount is doing lately, that they're trying to put out a bunch of franchise ideas to raise their profile so they can sell the company. That's been like it's swirling around in the discussion. And this feels like they couldn't get the 2009 cast back together to like agree to do the movie. So they're like, we'll do a different cast and we'll just do Star Trek babies again. And I just, I think it's stupid. <laughs> that's an interesting take. I guess my take is a little, little less jaded. I think with all this news that's been circulating <laughs> about and like they have a very dedicated audience on Paramount plus that's going to catch everything. Star Trek. I think the buzz about, you know, a, a continuation of the JJ, uh, franchise with a fourth film that maybe they saw an uptick in, in engagement when it came to that story. And so they're like, Hey, people are interested in this more, you know, casual entry level take to star Trek. And maybe they, they want to go back and yeah, an origin to your origin. I, I agree that it, I don't really see how it's going to work <laughs> unless you just want to, you know, explain the story of George T Kirk and, and so Pike might and both. Yeah. I'm so confused. Am I the only one that's confused? <laughs> <laughs> it is a little weird. The, the timing of the announcement and everything is weird. Yeah. They're confusing me. Like, what are you thinking, Haley? Like, what is in your brain? What so are they the not story? doing the four at all? They're just talking about doing this origin one? They're going to do both. Or they're talking both. about doing both? Yeah, no, they're going to do both. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're hitting this thing from both ends. We're going to chip away on both Whether ends. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> the thing about Star Trek Four, though, is they've been talking about that one for years now, ever since Beyond came out, and they haven't been able to get it together. So that's why that's why my theory is that, like, they like even, even if it is purely because fans were interested in it, like you were saying, Jay Scotty, the less jaded version of what I'm saying, uh, yeah. it, I think it's still that they couldn't get the cast together. So they're like, we want to do something in that universe. How about we go earlier, you know? Because I think we talked about this before. Because we were like, how do you get a young Chris Hemsworth? Because he was like so baby in that one. <laughs> and now oh, right, he's like right, right. Thor, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. We were like, that doesn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> but they're going to do it. <laughs> That was at one point the plan was to do a, a time travel story. I mean, maybe that's somewhat what this will be. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't because the, the cast doesn't know each other. If you go younger, the whole point was the first movie put them all together. So it was the origin story for one person. Is it going to be like a weird anthology origin story? It, yeah. It, I think it'd be better if they picked one actor from the 2009 and followed their story. Like let Sulu become a captain and follow that story. Mm. Or, you know, do something interesting with that universe moving forward. I just am tired of prequels. <laughs> it's really, we still got is. the Michelle Yeoh movie out there too. That's, that's happening and that's confirmed. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, we're, we're talking three or four Star Trek movies hitting theaters over the next couple of years. Like feels like Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of is doing the Star Wars thing. Like they're hitting a lot of. They got the animation. They got the Paramount Plus stuff. They got the the you know Strange New Worlds. They got. I mean, they got. They're working mm -hmm. on a lot of different uh, arenas right now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's all over the place. And and they very much done the Star Wars or Marvel model where for a couple of years there they were putting out something every week. Um, some show would go off and the next show would pick up. And they had like four running in succession for a while that were actually really great. But uh. The, the 2009 stuff, or like the, the returning to that universe stuff, feels like treacherous at this point to me. <laughs> so going back to Gladiator, <laughs> um, I will say those quotes of the people that were watching it were cinema owners, I believe. So I don't think they're going to say this movie sucks, which, <laughs> so you take it with a grain of salt. But I do think it's going to be an interesting kind of Just uh, let thought me buy experiment <laughs> to see who comes to see this movie. Audiences have seemed like they've really been into the action stuff, the Godzilla, the Civil War movie that just came out. Like, those are the things that are drawing people to theaters, which is fun. Like, if you're just into the big eating the popcorn blockbuster stuff, I think that's great. And I think this movie will do really well. Um, if it's not the case, you know, I don't know if 
people who loved it back in like my dad I think I've said on this cast my dad had three different copies of that movie in our house he had two VHSs and a DVD and I was like William why do you need all these but like will my dad go see because he's not a movie goer anymore like I don't know if it'll draw that crowd in the boomers so much it'll be I, I kind of am fascinated to see the demographics on Gladiator mm. too when it's see, all said and done see that's a good point because I think it can do at its best, I think it could do what Top Gun Maverick did, which is like exactly. it draws yeah, in the sure. old heads, you know, like the people who r- have fond memories of Gladiator, which is a lot of people. Like if you bring up that movie, especially to millennials, like they're they're like, I love that movie. I just watch that movie all the time. Like people were really into that. I mean, it was huge at the time. So I think if you can capture that, but then you've also got like the Paul Mescal, the Pedro, the, you know, kind of the appeal of like a new thing. And well, I've never seen Gladiator because I was young when it came out, but I'm kind of interested in this like i think it has the power to to pull from both those camps and really like become a blockbuster kind of like what top gun did Mm -hmm. totally and the addition of denzel washington can't be under like under under talked about i i think denzel denzel can carry a franchise himself and is like i am just always excited to see what he's going to do with the role so like yeah that I'm, i'm excited for that if nothing else he brings people out like that equalizer film had tons of like mm-hmm. it did, did really well because people just loved Denzel. Yeah. It's an entertaining yeah. movie. He got me out. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> Haley, to your point, I, I think you bring up a great point where this is cinema con. So like, these are the people that, you know, they're invested in the, the business of theaters. So they're going to put a positive spin on all, all of these, but just given the rich conversation we've had here, I will say like, I think this is a pretty strong showing from Paramount, like in a world where you've got your universals, your Warner brothers, your Disney's that have like these stables of IP. I, I think, you know, Paramount has made a pretty strong case for themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Warner Brothers already topped out a billion box office this year. Did I see that? Did I make that up? Sure. No, already. no, you didn't. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Mm-hmm. They're the first uh, first studio to hit a billion this year. Yeah, wow. that's what that's what Dune Dune and Godzilla and Kong will mm-hmm. do for you. Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it twice. Don't come at me. <laughs> <laughs> Ghostbusters is like we helped. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Rudd's like, yeah, I was there too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. We received our first indication of a title change for Thunderbolts when we caught a glimpse of the logo during Florence Pugh's set tour a couple of weeks ago. Kevin Feige confirmed the title change while remaining cagey during his appearance at CinemaCon, saying, yes, you'll notice the asterisk on Thunderbolts. Uh, That is the official title of Thunderbolts, and we won't talk more about it until after the movie comes out. Feige's straightforward yet cryptic confirmation has already sent the internet into a frenzy about the punctuation's implications. <laughs> How's our supply of red strings looking? Sorry, I was laughing at punctuation's implications. Is this, is, did you you wrote this week, didn't you, Jay Scotty? Is this a that was Jay Scotty me. week? Yeah, there's a lot of little Jay Scotty isms in here. <laughs> I feel like a prognosis on this plethora of projects in the last oh, one. You I was like, oh, you know. Jay Scotty lots of alliterations. <laughs> lots of alliteration. Lots it's of like an artist rhyming. signing his work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this is how they taught me to write a press release, like a robot. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, oh, no, no, no. So I looked up like the true definition of asterisk because I know how it's used (laughs) generally but I was like what is you know what is the definition and it's used to indicate omission um, of information or what was the phrase they used Uh, doubtful matter and I was like that's kind of interesting they wouldn't have done this without being very intentional about having it be thunderbolts with an asterisk so the question is um, what is the omission is it a character is it um like a plot point that we think we're going to get that they go a totally different way on is it oh well the thunderbolts you think you know what kind of team they're going to be but we're going to twist that into a different team than like what's in the comics what you're expecting i don't know it it leads to it does lead to a lot of red string because i was like i don't know Mm -hmm. what i have to say about this and then i looked it up and i was like hmm (laughs) dark uh (laughs) omission of doubtful matter that stays with me (laughs) Mm. I really like the uh, start of your thing being Webster's Dictionary says. Yeah, well, I was like, hey, (laughs) dictionary.com, my best friend. (laughs) I also love that they have it spelled out on Merriam Webster's ass to risk. (laughs) And dictionary.com is like as to risk. (laughs) So, which one is it? 
almost feels like an episode of commute with the uh, the level of education we're getting here with the the proper use of asterisk because I did not do that research so I just kind of went on off of my base knowledge of what I understood in asterisks to me and I kind of took it like you know that's usually an indication of additional information or like hey look to this footnote so that's kind of where I was going with it is this like saying hey the thunderbolts are going to be a little bit of like a footnote in history like they're going to be expendable mm. sorry f- for that reference I do not mean to reference that <laughs> franchise at all uh, but yeah I, I I kind of get in, I just my mind starts going towards like the the government like subterfuge and sabotage and, and and secrecy like I'm imagining like seeing a lot of documents redacted and like that's what I think about this title like yeah we know them as the Thunderbolts but does anybody else in universe like have that knowledge and will they have that knowledge of their sacrifice going forward? I kind of suspect not. And it would be kind of cool if we as fans get to have like kind of this privileged knowledge about, you know, a, a huge undergoing in the, in the MCU. And as I say that out loud, I think about like other instances where it actually feels like that to, but, but to worse effect Tiamat, I'm looking at you. Nobody seems to know about Tiamat, but um, <laughs> that's just, that's kind of where I'm coming at it from. I, I think it's really exciting. I love the conversation and kind of the like, it's kind of passive viral marketing that's happening here. And uh, I think it's a really smart move and, and, it's, and it's really creative. And as somebody that likes words and, and considers myself a bit of a wordsmith, I, I just, I love the uh, ingenuity on display here. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things that like people who just watch these movies is, are never going to notice, right? I mean, it's just, it's not something that's going to stand out to you at all. But for people who are fans of this, who followed everything and they kind of follow all the news and they hang on Feige's words and try to parse everything up and theorize, like they love stuff like this because it does suggest something bigger. It suggests like maybe it's the Thunderbolts, but not what you think, or maybe it's, uh, maybe they're actually something different or like we've theorized on the show before maybe it ends with all of them dying like you know like or whatever Mm -hmm. like maybe there's like bigger implications here or maybe it's just an asterisk and it doesn't mean anything but at the end of the day (laughs) it does get people talking and and that's fun like that's that's what people at least in part uh, who are fans of this stuff love the mcu for is that it does give you this room to to hang out and think and theorize and project and uh, to me, like that's that's the biggest takeaway for me here is like, you know, Feige was having fun with it, like throwing out there, oh yeah, we changed the title a little bit, and we're not going to tell you what it means until after the movie. And to me, that that tells me like, yeah, it's it's got to be some kind of plot point that'll make total sense after the whole thing's said and done, which I think is is fun. That's exciting stuff. Yeah, just the secrecy makes me excited. The idea that they like it, it him saying like we'll talk about it after the movie comes out means there is a big secret. We're not supposed to know, which is not always the case with a Marvel movie. I feel like there's a lot of times we don't know how the movie's going to end. We don't know how, but like we know the the broad strokes of the movie, and the fact that they're keeping something from us that is in the title, or at least referenced in the title, that sounds really exciting to me. I like I like secrets. <laughs> All right, well, jump before we before we go to our ad break and uh, everything, uh, get to our lightning round after the break. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, tell everybody about uh, Patreon, our Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash multiverse newscast and sign up. We put a lot of work into the show every week. And if you are uh, someone who likes to listen to the show every week, uh, go give us that little like $1 a week tip. There's a $4, four dollar level support the show. You get the ad free access um, to the audio version of the podcast uh, over there. And uh, yeah, we uh, we appreciate all you guys. Who, who have joined us over there and uh, on social media, you can find us as well. Most places we are multiverse newscast. Um, and then what's the one that we're not Twitter, yeah. Twitter. That would be Twitter. We are MV newscast. <laughs> MV newscast. Some guy that hasn't posted since like 2010 has multiverse newscast for some reason. Just at Elon. He'll take care of it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're listening, reach out. <laughs> <laughs> he he's squatting on that name, waiting for a big payday. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes on him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we will be right back after this with our lightning round and our Spotify poll for the week. Be right back. 
Welcome back to Multiverse News. Uh, well, last uh, two weeks ago, we threw out a YouTube question to be posted on our, uh, yeah, as as a YouTube comment, and we said the top comment would get we would read it on the on the show and give a prize to. Um, and our the question was, what do you think? We, it was our it was our one year anniversary. We said, what do you think will be uh, the biggest story we're going to talk about this year? And TJ Stafford had the number one comment. Uh, said, I'm sure there will be a lot of discussion of the MCU moving forward in a post-Majors era. How will they shift gears now that their Kang plan didn't pan out as hoped? Also, there will never be a shortage of James Gunn comments to talk about. No, he's on the lightning round today. <laughs> he's uh, He's been pretty busy lately with Superman and started shooting Peacemaker last week or something, too. Yeah. So maybe maybe mm-hmm. keeping him busy oh. that keeps him out of the out of the press a little bit. I can't wait for Peacemaker season two. <laughs> and from what I heard from Dave from DC on screen, he was telling me that they've they've said that Peacemaker is set in the new universe. Season two is set in the new universe even though season one was set in the other universe and they will explain it on screen. I think yeah, we, we, we talked, talked about, about it. You weren't here that oh, week that we I wasn't talked here. about I wasn't it, here, yeah. but yeah, it was, we're all, we're all confused by it too. <laughs> I love it. I think it's long, long story short. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sounds super fun. Just like if it, we, we, we used to talk about that on the MCU cast that like, if they were going to get rid of the Fox universe, the one thing they could bring over easily would be Deadpool because he's just that kind of guy who can just go, I'm in a new universe now and you're fine with it. And I think Peacemaker has that same sort of, uh, je ne sais quoi <laughs> about him that he could just be like, whoops, I fell through a portal. I'm in this universe now. And then just continue the story. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Uh, okay. So, uh, that's my comment on that lightning round from last week. Uh, is that kind of a couple weeks rebuttal? ago? But yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> we were both done. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Well, up next we got our Spotify poll. Uh, it said, "How do you feel about the Silver Surfer casting?" Um, we have uh, no, the first. The, first, the top answer was reserving judgment at fifty-two point five percent. Below that, we have people saying they're amped at twenty-two percent, and uh, tied at ten percent was on the fence and ambivalent, and then. <laughs> Uh, the last is disappointed. Only 5% are disappointed. Uh, I really like our audience. I like that, like, I like that they're willing to go and press a thing to vote, but <laughs> they're thoughtful enough to reserve judgment. <laughs> like, like, that's, like, the internet is full of people who are ready to take a hard stance one way or the other. And I just love our audience. And they're like, most of them are like, you know what? I'm not so sure. I'm waiting to see. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you listen to this show, I mean, we're you know we're not we're not here to get your anger reactions. We want you to enjoy yourself here and have you know, cut loose a little bit. We're not we're not here to get you riled up. All right, let's go around and give our top <laughs> thing that will get the most angry reaction. Go, Haley. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> lightning round you guys know how this works i'm gonna read a story we're gonna claim that story with our names and we're gonna stick to it we're gonna say that person gets to respond and we're gonna have one rebuttal in the lightning round because this needs to be a lightning round we did go very long uh <laughs> james gunn <laughs> revealed the official insignia for his dcu version of superman during CinemaCon. the emblem features a clean and simplistic design that is reminiscent of the logo from the kingdom come comic line Scotty, uh, I am not. I have not read the Kingdom Come storyline, but I know it's it's wildly popular. I know the artwork from Alex Ross is like instantly recognizable. It kind of harkens back to almost like an oil painting, kind of like um, like romanticizing of, of these characters and the in the depiction there. So, in terms of this logo, it did kind of remind me of what uh, the logo that we saw on My Adventures with Superman. So, if you're going to you know pay any homage or harken to that series at all, that bodes super well for me and i think it's just different from anything else we've seen live action so yeah i I think in terms of like being a kryptonian symbol and looking like it could be from another world and another planet i I think it works really well and also um does exactly what james gunn has said this version of superman is going to be it's a return to that optimism and i think that really shines through with this design deadpool and wolverine are joining the viral popcorn bucket craze while promoting the film at CinemaCon. kevin feige confirmed an internationally crude 
Sorry. <laughs> national. Yeah, national. I mean, that, that does just make you Randy, baby, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say intentionally crude and rude. Bucket was being designed by Deadpool himself. Jay, uh, of course they are. I mean, like, of course they are. Like, why wouldn't they? I mean, I think Ryan Reynolds put out um, right when the Dune thing was happening, like, just wait till you see the Deadpool popcorn bucket, like, trying to be funny. <laughs> and then, of, of course, when you see that that gets millions of impressions, you're like, well, I guess we're really doing it. Um, as far as it being intentionally lewd, um, I, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. I don't know, like, how far you're allowed to go with this. Seems like uncharted territory <laughs> in the in the entertainment they did industry. The sandworm <laughs> thing, so I think you can be as lewd as you want to be, <laughs> 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 yeah. intentional or not. <laughs> the sandworm had deniability, though. Like you know, <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, "It's a worm." You seen the movie? The worms, you know, the worms look like this. <laughs> Scotty with a rebuttal the, the funny thing is we haven't talked about it on the show but I saw a quote from an AMC executive who said if they had known that the popcorn bucket was going to be a thing like that they never would have done it <laughs> what a fool yeah. fire that person I, immediately I call BS, <laughs> I call BS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's weird uh, okay Lionsgate shifted the crow release to August 23rd from its initial June 7th date and postponed Saw 11 by a year, now set for September 26, 2025. Scotty, uh, the Crow pushback isn't all that surprising. I think uh, an August release date makes more sense with some of the competition it'll be facing in early summer. Uh, looking at Saw 6, or no, excuse me, Saw 11. <laughs> read my Roman numerals correctly there. Uh, the advancement of a year, I wonder if that's just to create some more space and anticipation. Uh, I think it's kind of a right move after, you know, having a, a new Saw movie last Halloween. I, I, I think waiting a year in between or, you know, having a full year in between the two is two years in between, actually. Sorry. I'm, when it comes to numbers, I'm, I'm not doing too well right now. But. <laughs> <laughs> Haley Steinfeld joined the cast of Ryan Coogler's untitled horror thriller film and will star alongside Michael B. Jordan. Scotty, I love all of the talent behind the camera, in front of the camera on this one, and I think Haley Steinfeld is an awesome addition. Uh, just increases my excitement and anticipation for this one. StarWars.com announced a new comic miniseries starting July 3rd called Star Wars Inquisitors. Haley. The Inquisitors have never had their own comics. They've appeared in other ones before, notably Darth Vader comics. But this is coming, what will be kind of on the end of Tales of the Empire, which comes out on May 4th, and it's very Inquisitor-focused. So, smart move. Sweet. Lionsgate announced that Blumhouse will revive the Blair Witch Project. It's currently unclear if the film will connect to the original 1999 film or reimagine the concept. Jay? Um, I think this is fascinating that you would uh, try to... I mean, they've done it once before. Am I right on that, Scotty? Did they try to do like a, a Blair Witch Project? There have been sequels. Yeah, or there sequels, have been sequels, I'm thinking of. Yes. Yeah. 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 Like, they... You know, what made that first film so powerful? I mean, you could write a book on just what that film did uh, in the time that it happened because it... It came out at a time with no internet, and so people mm -hmm. literally thought that it was a that it was a camcorder that someone found in the woods and made it into a movie. Like I remember hearing people say that, like at school, like being like, "Is this real? Like, is this a real thing?" And like really thinking it was real and going out and seeing it because of that. The budget on that movie was so low, and it made so much more uh, than what the budget was, and it really just kind of like defined that genre of like found footage and kind of launched that whole sort of world. And so the idea of bringing that into the now and trying to, I don't, again, like it's not clear. Are we trying to do it again? Are we trying to like make a sequel in a way, but do it in the modern world where we, we know that found footage is fictional, but like, trying to kind of straddle that and figure out like how do we make that franchise work with all those new the new world that we're in i think that's really fascinating um and i think uh found footage has been one of those genres that has grown a lot 
but I still think there's some untapped potential there. Like I still think you can do some interesting and new things in that genre. I don't think it's hit its ceiling. So I'm definitely intrigued by it. I think it's a, it's a cool idea. Um, the idea of like Jason Blum being involved, I think it's a good call. And, um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something I'm definitely interested in hearing more about. Margot Robbie's production company, Lucky Chap, will produce a film based on the board game Monopoly. Haley, I'm here for this. <laughs> Rebuttal should have been Catan. <laughs> I mean, that one might be coming. It's only a matter of time. Yeah. She's doing The Sims, and now she's doing Monopoly. I mean, it, yeah. it's like, I mean, I don't know. It's, I feel like the take for this for me, I guess this is a rebuttal. Uh, I guess the take for this for me <laughs> is that um, it's the same as when we talked about The Sims. Like, how self-aware are we going to be? Because I think, like, mm -hmm. in Monopoly, you can say a lot if you want to say a lot uh, about the world that we live in and ownership yeah. and the ownership of labor and distribution of wealth and all these types of things. Like, you can say stuff, but do you want to say that stuff? Like what Barbie said about society, you know, it went there, right? Like, do you want to go there? Uh, and I think if you want to go there, like, I'm more intrigued. Because I think like there's there's an ability to do that. The question that I do have for everybody though is, who are we going to cast for? Um, what's the guy's name? Mister Moneybags or whatever <laughs> was it? He's got a he's got a name. Penny bags. <laughs> he's got a name. I mean, who's our casting for him? I mean, hmm. don't say Chris Pratt. Pedro Pascal. I was going to say Chris Pratt. <laughs> Bob Balaban. <laughs> who? Who? He shows up in Wes Anderson films a lot. Bob Balaban. <laughs> okay. Cool. I kind of, yeah. I'm kind of, yeah. I can't get the uh, the guy. What's the guy that plays the guy in Succession? Um, what's that actor's name? Oh, Wamsgams. Uh, ooh, yeah, kind of good. Kind of like, kind of <laughs> like him. Kind of like him for that. McFadian. <laughs> mm -hmm. He would be good. Okay, Nita Costa, director of the Marvels and Candyman, is in discussions to direct the second film in Sony's 28 Days Later sequel trilogy, uh, with Danny Boyle returning to helm the first sequel from writer Alex Garland. Scotty, I like to hear this. Uh, Nita DaCosta, I felt kind of bad for her coming out off the heels of the Marvels because it's not the first time we've seen kind of like an indie filmmaker that you know has a couple of really good outings get swept up by the Marvel machine and kind of get chewed up by it. Like I think of Chloe Zhao as well as another example. So the fact that Nia DaCosta gets this opportunity to kind of return to her roots, but also gets to work with incredible talent like Alex Garland and Danny Boyle. And uh, yeah, I'm particularly excited after having just seen uh, Civil War last weekend, which Alex Garland wrote and directed. Um, I'll just take this opportunity to do a little mini review there. I don't think it's the film that a lot of people are expecting it to be. It's kind of like A24 doing what they always do. Their marketing machine is one thing, but it ends up being a much more smaller, personal, character-driven film. So knowing that, th that those are Alex Garland's sensibilities and he's going to be writing, uh, I think that'll only you know bolster Nia DaCosta's career, which I think she's in, in need of right now. Tim Kring, the creator of superhero drama series Heroes, is pitching a sequel titled Heroes Eclipsed to, to potential buyers. The original series aired for four seasons on NBC and was followed by a limited series titled Heroes Reborn in 2015. Matt, uh, I feel like Heroes is in a weird place. Like it, I think that Heroes was popular because people were hungry for superhero media at a time we didn't have it yet. Like it was this like thing. Hey, superheroes are on TV. I remember being excited, like a serious take on superheroes on TV. And now that's everywhere. So I just think that, I don't know that heroes has the cachet to continue its run. It, it, unless they do something really interesting. Also, I think it's funny. This came out the week of the eclipse and it feels like the guy who wrote the movie was, uh, wrote, wrote, this was like, Hey, we should, there's an eclipse. We should talk about heroes again. Shouldn't we? Let's do an eclipse. <laughs> please, please. Let's do heroes again. That's what happened in heroes. I believe. Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> what, when heroes was in its first season, like it was huge. Like that was a huge oh, show. Yeah. It was before the big like revival of the superhero genre that we've seen today. Mm -hmm. Like it was a new thing. Like all the superheroes are getting their powers and they're all crossing over. Like that was kind of like a precursor in a way to like yeah. what M Marvel and DC did. Like, I don't know. It's uh, it was a moment when it happened, but I think that moment, I don't know, it might be past at this point, especially with all the yeah. superhero stuff in our culture now. Like, are people wanting more of that? Like, from a new franchise? Like, I don't know. Maybe if they bring back Peter Petrelli because 
he's famous for this is us now um <laughs> like maybe maybe has a some brings in some this is us audience <laughs> you're talking about milo vinta miller yeah, however you ever say that last name <laughs> I think it's vinta miglia or something like that vil okay. miglia i can't remember yeah Something like that. Yeah. Good old Milo. Monarch Legacy of Monsters has been renewed for season two at Apple TV+. Plus. In addition, Apple struck a deal with Legendary Entertainment to develop multiple spinoff series set in the MonsterVerse. Jay. Oh, yeah, baby. We're getting that MonsterVerse money. You know, we went out. We saw Godzilla Kong. Everybody saw it. Uh, everybody was eating it up. And they were like, we need more of this. Give me more MonsterVerse. I mean, it's proof that people <laughs> want it. So... You yep. know, of course, I mean, this, this was all contingent on how Godzilla and Kong did and it did really well. So, you know, people, this is, people love this stuff. They want more of it. Indeed. Star yeah. Wars author, John Jackson Miller is pinning Batman Resurrection, a continuation of Tim Burton's 1989 Batman film set immediately after its events in contrast to the Batman 89 comics, which occur after both Burton films. Haley. This is so random, and when I saw it, I was like, <laughs> why are we doing this? But I love it, because that's Michael Keaton, Keaton is my Batman forever and ever and ever, amen. Um, and John Jackson Miller, <laughs> he is a great author. His Star Wars books are really beloved. He just had a new one come out called The Living Force, which was really good. Um, so I am super excited about this. Bring it on. Awesome. Glenn Powell, star of Anyone But You, Twister's and Top Gun Maverick will star in Paramount's The Running Man, a new adaptation of the Stephen King novel that Edgar Wright will direct. Scotty? I, I, anytime you're going to give Glenn Powell a leading vehicle like this, I think it's a good move. He's a guy that I, everything he's ever popped up in, I think he's always a standout. He's got a lot of charisma, uh, a lot of talent, and he's clearly an attractive guy. So I'm excited for the future of his career, and I'm still kind of holding out hope that one of these days, either Marvel or DC is going to scoop him up. Paramount Plus has renewed Star Trek Strange New Worlds for a fourth season, while Star Trek Lower Decks will end its run on the streamer with its upcoming fifth season debuting in the fall. Uh, Matt, this is obviously a mixed bag for me. I really like both these shows. These are probably my favorite Star Treks on right now. Strange New Worlds is what I go to Star Trek for, but uh, Lower Decks is just really fun every week. So uh, I'm bummed at Lower Decks leaving, but I'm excited that Strange New Worlds is continuing. And I have a feeling Strange New Worlds is just going to have legs for years and years because it's it seems to be hitting what Star Trek fans were looking for kind of all along. Keanu Reeves is set to join Sonic the Hedgehog 3 as the voice of Shadow the Hedgehog. Scotty, I think there are a few video games that I have poured as many hours into as Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the GameCube, which is where so uh, excuse me, Shadow the Hedgehog made his debut. So I have heard a lot of that character, and I still on occasion, like if something upsetting kind of happens or I'm like, you know, sullen about something, I'll just do my best Shadow Maria. That's what he says when he <laughs> dies. So just even doing that, I can totally hear Keanu doing that. Maria. <laughs> Maria? Okay, we got to wrap up, but like, what's why does he say Maria? Why He's got a figure from his Maria? past named Maria, and she's like the, the only source of like softness and compassion from him because he's a very aloof and standoffish and dark character. But Maria is the one that will <laughs> elicit some kind of emotion from him. So he definitely Maria. got his job because of John Wick, and I love it. I'm all here for it. <laughs> <laughs> tiny but the promotion for this movie is going to be super fun because you've got him uh idris elba a uh, jim carrey is in this movie like imagine all those guys on the red carpet together that's going to be super fun yeah absolutely jonathan bailey one of the stars of the upcoming wicked films is in early talks for a leading role in the upcoming jurassic world film Haley. <laughs> My Lord Anthony Bridgerton can be in anything he wants, and him and Scarlet together in a Jurassic movie sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> when I put that in today, I was like, I wonder if anyone's going to have a take on this, and I guess I just underestimated I it. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> is, is he the guy from Bridgerton? Well, there's lots of guys. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> He's Shows the what season I know. two guy. <laughs> okay. All right. Probably not the guy I'm thinking of then. He was in... Um, Fellow Travelers or All of Us Strangers? Oh, he's great recently. in Fellow Travelers. Oh, okay. Is it fellow I know Travelers? You're about really yeah, great yeah. in Fellow Travelers. Cool. He's great. Uh, Steve Buscemi has joined the cast of the second season of Netflix's Wednesday in an undisclosed role. Scotty, this 
seems like a natural fit and I'm trying to rack my brain. Have Steve Buscemi and uh, Tim Burton worked together in the past? If they haven't, That's it feels like question. such an obvious thing. Like how have they not? Yeah. 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 Definitely feels, definitely feels right. And yeah, he feels like he'll fit into the Adams world a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. Pamela Anderson has joined the cast of the Naked Gun reboot starring Liam Neeson. <laughs> Haley, um, I don't know. Go Pam. Like she's living her best life right now. I feel like good for her. <laughs> <laughs> While appearing on the View to promote his Apple TV Plus show Franklin, Michael Douglas said he wanted to be killed off in Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantumania. Per Douglas on the show, I said I'd like to have a serious death um, with all the great special, all these great special effects. Uh, there's got to be some fantastic way where I can shrink to an ant size and explode, whatever it is. I want to use all those effects, but that was on the last one. Now, I don't think I'm going to show up for a fourth. <laughs> you know, that Jay, that you know this is exactly what he said, too, when he went to the room. He's like, listen, I got a great idea. I die, but I shrink down to an ant size and I explode. And they're like, get out of here, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing serious <laughs> stuff. <laughs> like he hadn't thought about it's, it past that. You know, it was like I can just shrink down and explode. <laughs> Whatever <Yeah>. that is. <laughs> Whatever that means. This has got Harrison. This has got Harrison Ford energy. You know, like like <laughs> I'll, I'll listen. I'll be Han Solo, but you gotta kill me. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like one of the downgrades about the Ant Man movies is there's been no like character death. You know, and he was kind of like, "Give me the character death," <laughs> and they were like, "No, we need you." <laughs> <laughs> I'll take this opportunity to say what I've been saying since 2015 when we got that first Ant-Man movie and the movie opens with the de-aging sequence with uh, Michael Douglas as Hank Pym. Ever since we got that, I want a Disney Plus or whatever kind of series going back and showing Hank Pym's early days and cast Alan Tudyk. Guy is a ringer mm, for a yeah. young Michael Douglas <laughs> and he is so talented he could do it. Oh, yes, yeah, he'd be a great Ant-Man too. Just, hey, you got a you got a pitch on your hands. Stop. And call yeah, it Flaggy. Get really Flaggy good. on the phone. Oh, yeah. he's listening. <laughs> and have y'all, have y'all ever seen Dollhouse? No, I have not. Uh-uh. Alan Tudyk is in that, and he plays a role that, like, really f- plays against type for him. And, like, ever since that, I've just been like, oh, he can he can do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, he, he went he's, to he's got chops. <laughs> he's got- To make chicken uh, noises. More flexibility than I expect uh, from, because yeah, I think of the chicken noises and I think of the, uh, you know, the droid noises, but also like Wash and just like him being sort of an affable guy, but he, he plays a little bit of a darker character in Dollhouse and I, he's awesome at it. Um, okay, well, um, that is it for the show, you guys. Let's go around quickly to say where we, people can find you online. Haley Hobbs. Uh, source pages. We just dropped a Star Wars discussion on uh, Darth Bane Rule of Two, and then next week we're going to be doing Dead Boy Detectives for the Netflix show that's coming out. And then catch me on Bill and Ashley's Terror Theater soon for Ready or Not and Abigail. And Jay Sisson. Yeah, well, you can find me at Commute the Podcast uh, normally on Monday mornings where you can learn something uh, interesting uh, on your way to work in about 20 minutes. But um, Matt and Scotty and I are covering Fallout on uh, Pandavision, the uh, Prime series Fallout. Uh, It's got eight episodes. We're doing two at a time. So right now, as of the recording of this show, uh, episodes one and two and episodes three and four are well, I guess like two episodes, one and two and three and four are out. So if you're watching Fallout on Prime and uh, or if you're thinking about watching it, uh, you got a companion show to listen to while you do it. So come catch us over there. Yeah. And Jay Scotty St. Clair. Yeah, please do go check out that PandaVision coverage of Fallout. I think we're having some really fun conversations over there. But also you can find me on Animation Deliberation where we just got our Invincible Season 2 review out there and X-Men 97 just hit its halfway point um, as well as The Bad Batch almost being done with its season run here. So you can expect a lot of coverage from us. And then also on Bingers, I am currently assembling a crew to cover the Planet of the Apes film, starting with the 2011 Rise of the Planet of the Apes in preparation for Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. So you can expect to see that hit your feed soon. Awesome. I'm putting together a team. (laughs) Yeah. And I mirror what all of you guys have said about the fallout coverage on Pandavision. I'm really having fun. It's a really fun show. And like it, all the stuff that I like talking about 
is like couched in that show. And I want to, I, uh, I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, Pandavision everywhere you get podcasts and uh, we'll be back next week with more multiverse news. Uh, and we'll talk to you soon. Peace. You stay classy multiverse. Hey, thanks for listening to multiverse news, uh, or watching it or whatever you're doing, you know, eyeballs or ear holes, whichever thing. Uh, we, uh, we do this show every week and we appreciate you listening. Uh, it's strandedpanda.com is where you can find all of our podcasts. And, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, check us out. Uh, wherever you get podcasts, uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, hit the little bell icon, whatever you have on whatever service you're doing, rate us, like us, we're really thirsty, that's what I'm saying. (laughs)